I want to welcome our presenters today who are talking about the subject of Texas Indians reimagining the future of repatriation. And to get us started, I'm gonna turn over to uh, Maria Rocha. And let's get you up here. Oh, we got the presentation going. It's all yours. Thank you. Amanam, Mi'av, Maria Rocha, to Miakan Garza, Kwawaltekan Pilam, Executive Director to Indigenous Cultures Institute. Namestia Abatsai Yanawana Ko Yana Tatai, Juan Hane Apapa Repatriation Conference. Hello, my name is Maria Rocha of the Miakan Garza Kwawaltekan people. Executive Director of the Indigenous Cultures Institute. We pray that the ancient spirit water and spirit of Mother Earth will be with us during this repatriation conference. This is our panel of speakers, Dr. Ruben Ariano, Dr. Mario Garza, and Emily Aguilar. Our panel will focus on the indigenous people in Texas. Because of our situation in Texas, the way we were colonized by the Spaniards who stole our land and left us without the option of treaties with the United States, and the way we were terrorized by the Republic of Texas Indian extermination policies, our story is both unique and familiar. I'll be your moderator and take you through the panel presentations of Texas Indians Reimagine the Future of Repatriation. We'll begin our panel with the topic Accountable to the Past, presented by Dr. Ruben Ariano. Dr. Ariano will take you through a historical account of Texas Indians, our origins and continued existence as indigenous people in Texas. He'll chronicle the efforts of the Miyagan Garza Band in historic events that forged a legacy of ancestral reclamations and reburials. Dr. Ariano is a member of the Miyakan Garza Band, a state legislature recognized tribe of Texas. He is a scholar, activist, and professor of history. His research explores Chicana Chicano indigeneity, Mexican indigenous nationalism, and Guavaltecan identity resurgence. Other areas of research include the US Southwest, Mesoamerica, and Native North America. He has presented and published widely on these topics and has taught at various institutions. His many years of research of Texas Indians and his lifelong connection to his indigenous roots makes him conversant with the history of the Guavotecan people. He, he resides in Dallas, Texas with his family and teaches history at Dallas College, Dr. Ariano. Amanam. Uh... Thank you, Maria, for uh, the introduction and welcome to everyone to our presentation. And we thought that we would start the first part of the presentation with giving you kind of a brief sort of overview of who we are as a people, just in case some of you have never heard of us or might have heard of us, but um, as is commonly um, believed that we went extinct and, and we did not. We still exist and reside in Texas and various communities. And so who were these Kualtecum historical peoples? Um, the term Kualtecum itself is used to describe numerous nomadic groups that roamed Central and South Texas and Northeastern Mexico before European arrival. And uh, the historical records actually document Kualtecum activities during the Spanish period, the Mexican period, the Texas period, and the American periods and all these different documentations that I've been able to discover over the years uh, demonstrate evidence of historical continuity of our communities. Next. Next slide, please. So historical Kualotecans uh, were a diverse but uh, a group of people. And as you can see from the map there, at least here in Texas, that those are our traditional homelands. And of course, this is not to say that we were the only people there. This is just to say that these are the areas that we um, roamed as hunter-gatherer populations, uh, at least in the Texas part of it, but also on the Mexican side. 
and we share a common root. Um, you know, we were basically a loose con connection of uh, communities that shared the same geographic space, spiritual practices, cosmology, material culture, and spoke related and sometimes even unrelated languages. Um, but we were all uh, kind of in the same area and we had a lot of cross-pollination uh, between the various groups. Next, please. Now, in this slide, you will see that there's uh, two maps. Uh, the one that is on the left side is a close-up of a, a place called La Laguna in what is now present-day Torreón, Coahuila, which is in Mexico. And then on the right, you will see that this is vaguely uh, the Coahuatecan homeland that encompasses mostly what is South Texas, parts of uh, uh, northeastern Mexico. And of course, as I was saying, these areas are shared by other indigenous groups. Uh, and there was a lot of interaction between our ancestors and people that are known as, for example, the Tamaulipecos, the Karankawas, the Tonkawas. And there was a lot of sharing back and forth. And so um, oftentimes, you know, our people sort of get forgotten because they're not known to have existed during the historical period that uh, pertains to Anglo-America. But there's a lot of documentation that goes back to the Spanish period. Next, please. And so part of the early documentation for our people stems to um, the early Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca Relacion. When he encountered our ancestors back in the years between 1528 and 1536, when he was stranded with a fellow, several of his fellow compatriots, and one of whom was uh, an enslaved African Moor by the name of Estebanico, who ended up going through uh, leading the expedition uh, uh, some of the early entradas into what is now New Mexico and uh, a previous uh, presenter was sort of touching upon those um, experiences in, in New Mexico with the Pueblo. And so there's a relationship going on with, with our communities. But it was Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca whose interest, um, you know, his uh, relación, his account, in other words, is the one that sparked the interest among the, uh, the Spanish to go explore the farther uh, northest regions of what they consider to be their empire. And so that's when Coronado comes in and all these other expeditions that end up venturing into what is now Texas and the Southwest. Next, please. And so um, some of Cabeza de Vaca's account uh, in his years among our ancestors led to those interests and he documented not only the, the people that, that were in the relación, but he also uh, noted um, people like the Cantona, the Carrizo, Comecrudo, Miaca, and the Paya. All these people were around at the time that uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca was trekking throughout Texas. And these are some of the tribes that still exist today in Texas. And see, some of these people are the descendants of what later um, became, uh, I mean, the ancestors of what later became the, uh, the Mission Indians, and we are their descendants. Next, please. And so this is an example of the ways that the Spanish came into our homelands and began to colonize and to convert us into happy little Spaniards. And when I say the word Spaniards, I use that in quotation marks because a lot of the people that were being brought to establish some of these early communities in, in what is now South Texas and Northeastern Mexico, a lot of these folks were actually either mestizos, meaning mixed with uh, African, Spanish, and indigenous, or a lot of them were just basically just indigenous populations who were being brought as part of that front of colonization. And so by the year 1674, you have the Franciscan friar Juan Larios, who arrived on our homelands and began calling the region Coahuila, because that's one of the terms that he understood best from our people. And Coahuila just essentially means place of abundant trees. And so our people were telling him, we are the people here of this place with the abundant trees. And so people like, like Juan Larios slowly paved the way for future interaction between native people and, and in the Northern frontier and the Spanish. And his efforts led to the first missionizing efforts along what is now the US-Mexico border and especially into Texas. The first uh, missions in Texas didn't begin until after 1700, like in 1710. And this one, the, the Mission de los Peyotes was one of the first ones that was established in 1674, which is kind of like the launching ground into Texas. And, and, and the reason why he named it Los Peyotes, Larios did, is because he understood that our people had that sort of connection to the sacrament 
and, and, the, and the ceremony. And so in, in his effort to lure our ancestors into the missions, that's one of the ways that, that he did it by, by you know, trying to blend these two traditions to, together in a way. Um, and, you know, in fact, this, this mission became a church in 1698, and it still exists. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see from the map there, it, um, it's, it's still a place of worship for a lot of people in, in that area. Next, please. But, you know, for our ancestors, life in the missions was hard. You know, Cuauhtecans were losing their traditional life ways. Our ancestors were being destroyed uh, through the mission life and, and its brutal uh, undertakings uh, and its baffling moral strictures and endless back-breaking labor. And all these things just became so unbearable. And so, yes, on the picture here, you see a very nice mission. And if you go to these places, they're very well kept. And, and our ancestors helped build this, but they also died in the process and not only the process of building them but also in the process of just living and being converted into uh spanish citizens because that was the, the the purpose of the missions was to establish control in the space but also to convert the populace into spanish citizens and so these experiences is how Cuauhtecans became mission indians and they helped establish the foundation for what later became uh, Tejano culture, you know, what a lot of people in South Texas are very proud of. Uh, and this is how we endured as a people. Next, please. And so doing the research, trying to trace that connection to, to our ancestors, I've come across some very interesting documents. For example, this one here uh, that was published in 1891 by J.W. Powell through the Bureau of Ethnology is a report that uh, mentions our people are specifically our band by name, the Miyakan and the Miyakan Garza. Garza is basically uh, heron in, in, in Spanish, Garza, and Miyakan, that's, that's our name in, in our language. And so documents like this, you know, they make a note of our ancestors still residing along uh, the borderlands, along the, the Texas, Mexico, uh, Rio Grande Valley up until the 1890s. Next, please. Next, and so we have further documentation. We have the the Twin Cities uh, document here. This is basically a booster type of uh, document that was published in 1893 that was trying to bring business to Brownsville and Matamoros in Mexico. And in it, it mentions the Carrizo group, which is a closely related group to ours. And it documents, you know, that they were still around. They had their own distinct community, and they they were using mesquite pots, which, which is a traditional uh, food source uh, of ours. And they were making, they used to roll it into balls and, and, and that's something that they ate. And they also used to make coffee-like drinks out of the seed pods. And so this document here, I mean, it's it's very explicitly, you know, stating, you know, these people are still around as late as 1893. And so that's part of that, that cultural continuity that we've had as a distinct people in Texas for a very long time. Next, please. And even into the early 20th century, 1921, as you can see from this uh, caption here from an article in the San uh, Antonio Express, uh, it says 30,000 flock to the San Fernando Cemetery. And so this is essentially a ceremony that's being done at a, one of the oldest cemeteries in San Antonio that is connected to, to one of the missions. And in a very, uh, a, in a subsection that's that's very uh, hard to really read, but you have to really squint, and, and, and I'll show you here in a minute, to see what, what it's saying about our ancestors. Uh, next, please. It says, and this is the subsection called Indian Decoration Day, right? And it says, from time immemorial down to this very day, our own Aborigines, the American Indians, especially the Yumas, Mojaves, Cocopas, the Aguinos, Maricopas, and other Indian tribes on September the 9th, and for five consecutive days, observe what they call in Spanish, La Fiesta del, and some of it is intel unintelligible, but it's saying Decoración or Recuerdo, it's essentially a memorial day, kind of like a Day of the Dead celebration. It's a, it's a, It was a, a way to honor uh, the ancestors. And so as late as 1921, we're still seeing documentation in the sources uh, that that show this this uh, continuity uh, and, and the presence of our ancestors still residing within the confines of South Texas and you know kind of central to South Texas along the especially in places where the missions were established and so that's what's important about the you know these kinds of documents that they establish that we as a people with connections to the missions were in fact present even into the 20th century and that we were continuing to practice our religious ceremonies 
And so this is um, very important because, you know, um, it is through our cultural understanding of these connections that we maintain that indigeneity that we have with our ancestors in this place that we call Texas today. Next, please. And so this is where we're, we're going to get into a little bit more technical stuff and bring it closer to home to the purpose of, of the conference and how it connects to repatriation. So it's useful to, you know, consider some of the terms. Some of the speakers earlier were saying that, you know, these things are fluid and I agree. No one can ever agree on what terms mean. And people are always finding different ways to redefine and reinterpret things. Um, but, you know, there's a general consensus that an indigenous person is someone who is defined as a person or group originating or occurring naturally in a particular place. You know, that's the very basic Oxford Dictionary definition. But then if you move over to different terms, like Office of Indian Affairs defines, you know, federally recognized tribes as those that have a government to government relationship with the U.S. But then what does that leave state recognized tribes like ours, like the Mia Cangarsa? You know, we have that state to uh, state relationship with with uh, with Texas, and and so are we American Indian? Are we Native American? Oftentimes we get those questions asked of us, and 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 so it's hard to to describe the situation to someone that doesn't experience it because, you know, when you say American Indian, that usually refers to some sort of like um, um, federal and legal sense of the word like you are people who are defined through through the government as being recognized federally as an american indian but when you say the term native american that can be a little bit more loose you can native american at least as a scholar and as someone who's been researching this for over you know 20 years uh, you know my interpretation of the word native american is that it encompasses anyone who is indigenous to the americas either north uh, america south america and anywhere in between and so the way that this gets a little uh, more, hits closer to home is by looking at some of the current indigenous peoples that have been migrating to the US. Next, please. And so for example, we have here the example of the mixed deck and, and the, uh, also the, uh, to a lesser degree, the, the Zapotec indigenous people from Mexico who, but you know, many times don't even speak Spanish. They only speak their native tongue. And so Spanish is their second language and they speak it, you know, just enough to get by. And then they have they come to, to the U.S. and they have to learn yet another language to get by. These people have maintained their, their distinct cultural roots, even in the places where they've immigrated to, you know, essentially mostly in, in uh, along the West Coast and California. And, and they've reproduced their, their, their own indigenous uh, ceremonies and celebrations. Uh, and, and, but are these people Native American? Are these people American Indian? You know, who's to say, right? Who makes that decision? Who makes that call? And, you know, according to my interpretation, I would say, well, maybe perhaps they're not American Indian in the legal sense, but they are Native people. They are Native American. They are indigenous to the United States, I mean, to, to the Americas. And so that's where kind of we, the Mia Cangarza and other Texas Indian tribes that have that state-to-state -state relationship that are not federally recognized have that similar association with the, the Mixtec and the Zapotec, where non-BIA tribes reside in this kind of third liminal third space, right? Uh, next, please. And the way that this relates to, to repatriation is that, you know, in Texas, you know, we have laws that govern archaeological sites on private land, and, you know, they're basically non-existent. You know, this idea that, that the state can come in and regulate private property is, is almost, you know, nil. And the fate of artifacts, in effect, always is determined by the proprietor. And, and these, these things affect us personally when we're trying to reclaim the remains of our ancestors. It creates a very unfortunate circumstance that places human remains and cultural artifacts in serious jeopardy. Uh, and so this is what we're up against as a state uh, recognized tribe, not only as an individual tribe, but uh, I would say that collectively we all are up against these kinds of challenges. And so with 30 years of experience, the Mia Cangarsa band in repatriation efforts, uh, we understand the complexities of the legal system in a way that as it pertains to us as a state tribe. And, but our position as a non-BIA uh, tribe puts us at a disadvantage oftentimes, and we're oftentimes having to go up against um, BIA recognized tribes. Uh, in, in these issues. So what happens when a state recognized tribe wants to repatriate their ancestors' remains or retrieve cultural artifacts based that are housed in public and private institutions? You know, what does that look like? Next, please. 
And so uh, I'll give you a, a brief example here. You know, in the case of our Powhatan uh, ancestors uh, in 1999, you know, we had a major repatriation that was uh, that took place, and in that year. Um, a lot of the remains that had been ex excavated going back to the 60s at Mission San Juan Capistrano in San Antonio, Texas, were finally returned. And largely, it was, you know, you could say that it was through NAGPRA, but not, not necessarily because this was, uh, these were remains that had been housed, uh, that had been excavated at, on church property. So it was really the church who was responsible and had the final say uh, for, for this. Next, please. And so, you know, as, as time went on, the Mia Cangarza not only got involved with the repatriation uh, um, issues in, uh, at the missions, but also in various locales around uh, Texas. And so, you know, the participation in repatriation dates for our band going back to the early 90s. And, and you know, one of the examples that occurred was uh, in 1989 uh, at Fort Hood when an archaeologist was hired there to help in repatriating uh, human remains, which, which had come from a person who had discovered a severely looted site on private property near the army post uh, and decided that he wanted to return those remains. And in the process of returning the remains, other discoveries were also made. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there was another event that occurred in February 20th of 1990. That's when the Leon River Medicine Wheel was discovered also within the confines of Fort Hood. Uh, and that day, Archaeological Survey Party discovered that uh, within the, the site of the remains, there was also the remains of, of six individuals that had been discovered out of rock shelter that was near there. And these were then transferred to Texas A&M for storage. And you know, our, our Dr. Garza, Tio, Tio Mario Garza, was present for both of, the, of these events. You know, he's been uh, involved with the Leon River Medicine Wheel and with the creation of the Comanche National Indian Cemetery over at Fort Hood since since day one. And so that major occurrence, that the, the, the discovery of the medicine wheel, the discovery of the remains coincided with, next please, with the emergence of the Comanche National Indian Cemetery, which uh, Dr. Garza also had a hand in uh, being a member of uh, that the the group that the, that was involved with repatriating the remains and involved with the creation of uh, taking care or taking care of the Leon River Medicine Wheel. And so all this is to say that in the following years, uh, next slide, please. Um, after the Fort Hood activities, um, you know, Dr. Garza, who was involved with an organization called ERIC, uh, which uh, was responsible for repatriating remains, became you know, that organization became inactive and eventually ceased to operate. And the absence of the organization left a huge void in Texas repatriation efforts, but it opened the door for more localized groups like ours uh, to continue that work. And it is through the efforts of our, the Mia Cangarza band through Dr. Garza uh, and through Tia Maria Rocha that we were able to establish a second Native American uh, repatriation resting place in Texas which is uh, located in, in San Marcos. Uh, next slide, please. And so here you, you'll see on the screen, you know, going back to 2011, uh, the Sacred Springs remain, you had some remains that were discovered in, in what is uh, what was called Aquarina Springs. Uh, it would used to be an old um, sort of uh, um, uh, a site where uh, like a, a venture site and it was purchased by the university and you know, in 2016, some, uh, the university was doing some excavations and then they decided uh, that they were going to um, uh, install a kiosk for the tickets. And that's where the ticket booth remains were discovered in 2016, uh, I mean, uh, 2011. And so after tests determined that they were culturally unidentifiable, you know, we placed a requ uh, request for the remains and we finally were able to get the remains back. Um, in 2016, and that's the same year that the city of San Marcos uh, also donated some land for the repatriation efforts uh, of the Mia Cangarza. And so now we have two uh, repatriation sites in Texas, one that is in Fort Hood and one that is uh, in San Marcos where we can hopefully uh, start collaborating uh, on repatriation efforts to try to bring all the remains in Texas to their final 
uh, resting place and help them get on to their journey. Next slide, please. And so if there's going to be a considerable effort in repatriating the remains of our ancestors, research and governmental institutions are going to have to agree to return them and the number of burial grounds will have to be increased to accommodate them. And a goodwill act of this magnitude will undoubtedly bring this country one step closer to healing the many scars that 500 plus years of European colonization in the Americas has brought on the land and its indigenous peoples. The establishment of the burial ground sends the clear message that Native American remains deserve the same dignity and respect afforded to non-Indigenous ones, a message that acknowledges the spiritual observances bestowed upon them at the time of their passing by our ancestors. So respect and dignity, these are the individual ideals that emanate, right? They emanate from the well of equality that is inherent in our shared humanity. And so it's in that spirit that we, the Mia Cangarsa Band, are here today. We are presenting at this conference so that future repatriation activists, BIA or not, so that we can start building the, these coalitions that I, I've heard about in previous um, uh, um, lectures that, and, and, and speakers that, has, that have come before us. And so we can, we can come together and you know, make these reinterments possible and successful but it's going to take hard work and it's not going to be in, at the individual tribal level in my opinion i think that if we come together under amicable negotiations we can have fruitful fruitful collaborations between indians of all tribes and that's what our hope is as a Miyakangarsa, that we can find that secret common ground together thank you nephew our next topic is Elders and Community Lead the Way, presented by Dr. Mario Garza. Dr. Garza will share his personal story and perspective of the differences between these institutions that embrace justice and will do the right thing, and those that refuse to acknowledge the human rights of indigenous people. His story of endurance and tenacity in the face of continual opposition has inspired his community to stand with the ancestors and fight for their reburial. Dr. Garza is a member of and serves as the cultural preservation officer for the Miyagan Garza Band. He is also board of elders chair and principal founder of the Indigenous Cultures Institute. Dr. Garza earned a multidisciplinary PhD from Michigan State University in social science with areas of concentration in sociology, political science, and social work. He has been active in graves protection and repatriation for over 30 years. Dr. Garza led a collaborative effort with the city of San Marcos and Texas State University to establish the first Texas City Repatriation Cemetery. He has pre presented before the NACPRA Review Committee twice, requesting transfer of ancestral remains which was approved by the U.S. Department of the Interior in 2015. Dr. Garza served two tours of duty in Vietnam and currently resides in San Marcos. Dr. Garza. Uh, Madam, uh, first I'm gonna be uh, talking briefly about my experience with repatriation, and then I'm going to talk about our experience with two university institutions about getting our ancestors and how they both have chosen to interpret NAPRA very differently. I have been involved with repatriation issues since before the 19, uh, 1900s, uh, like Dr. Adriano mentioned, I was part of a, an intertribal group of Indians uh, with the assistance of two medicine men, the National Medicine Wheel uh, Alliance. We activated the Leon River Medicine Wheel in Fort Hood, Killing, Texas in 1990. And then we established what is called the Comanche National Cemetery in 1991. At the time uh, when we established the uh, Comanche Cemetery, we were to repatriate several ancestors that the uh, archaeologists from Fort Hood 
was able to recover and no tribe was identified or the tribe that was identified chose to come and rebury their ancestors at the Comanche Cemetery. At this time, we were also able uh, to repatriate some Huahuatecan remains. If you can see on the slide there, and by the way, that picture was taken at the Comanche Cemetery. And there, you see a fence in the background. It was a 12-foot fence that the Army was able to build. And the uh, burial that I'm talking about is that long burial, burial in front of the photograph. But we repatriated uh, some Kowatekan remains. The first Kowatekan remain that we were able to repatriate was a uh, remain that had been on exhibit at a truck stop cafe in, in, uh, in Ohio. And when we found out about it, uh, the archaeologists found out about it, uh, we went over there to re recover the remain and repatriate it. And this remain had been stolen from a rock dwelling or a cave in central Texas, and it had been identified as well with Tekka. Next, please. I was also, I was also involved in the largest repatriation in Texas, which was the burial that we did at Mission San Juan in San Antonio, Texas. In uh, 1999, we repatriated close to 189 remains. The remains had been removed by two excavations by one of the museums in San Antonio. And uh, since they were on, at the mission, they were on private property, the property being owned by the Catholic diocese, of San Antonio, and with permission of the priest, they were, they remove all these remains. And when we got them back, it was about 30 years later, and all the, the remains were in small, broken pieces of bone, and all of them have marked some numbers, and, uh, and they have been sent to different uh, museums and universities for study. And so we, uh, and it took eight of us two weeks to cleanse the remains and to prepare them for burial by wrapping them in white cloth like we do in the repatriations that we do now. And this was the hardest emotional thing that I have ever done in my life, preparing all those remains for reburial. So it's not really easy for us to do repatriations. We do it because we feel that it is our obligation to do that. Like a lot of indigenous groups, we feel that when an individual dies, two things happen. That when the individual dies and is buried, two things happen. One is the physical process where the body starts disintegrating and starts mixing again with Mother Earth. The other is the spiritual part where the, the spirit of the individual goes on a spiritual journey. And uh, so when the remains are removed, it interrupts both processes, the physical process and the spiritual process. So the, uh, we believe that the spirit is out there in limbo, in agony. Next, please. I also wanted to mention that we reinterred the remains back at the, at the same place, exactly the same site, same place, the same mission where they have been initially buried and removed. Okay. Uh, back in 2003, uh, my wife retired from working with the city. I retired in 2005, and we uh, moved to San Marcos, Texas, where we believe that we came to this uh, earth, this level of this earth, 
through the through this through the sacred springs in San Marcos, the headwaters of the San Mar which is now the San Marcos River. So, uh, well, we uh, we we built an a nonprofit uh, organization called the Indigenous Cultures Institute, and eventually. This grew to 12 different programs. One of our major programs from the beginning has been the repatriation program. And during all this time, we work on building our credibility and our connections with the other indigenous communities, but very importantly, with the, the local political institutions both city and county and state. Next slide, please. Uh, while we were living here in San Marcos, we heard about a remain being uh, dug up. So we, uh, so I called the uh, Center for Agricultural or center to see if they would allow me to, to go there while they were removing the remain. And the director uh, said that I could go and that I could, you know, stay there as long as I wanted to and that I could pray while the remain was removed. So what had happened there was that they were, they built some restrooms for the glass bottom boat tours that they were still having. And they needed to connect the restrooms to the old utility unit and the septic tank. So while they were digging the track and, and the restrooms was a re women's restroom, a utility room and the men's restroom. So they decided to connect it from the women's restroom. So while they were digging the trench, they came upon a grave. So the contractor of the construction decided to remove the remain and uh, which was not the only option. This was a perfect example of where a remain did not have to be removed. It would have been just as easy to stop the, the trench there and connect it to, to from the men's restroom, which was at the other end of the building, or from the middle room, which was the utility room. But the contractor had already made a plan and he decided to stick to it. So they went and removed the remain. And I stay there uh, every, I went there every day and I stayed there all day praying uh, with the remain while it was being removed. And at that time I made the remain a promise that one of these days we were going to rebury to him. Uh, next, next slide, please. So we uh, we did a request through NEPRA, and uh, one of the things that we needed to provide was uh, it, it, because the remain was over a thousand years old, it had been classified as culturally unidentifiable, which the archaeologists who make the uh, the determinations decided to classify all remains that are over a thousand years old as culturally identifiable, which makes it very hard for them to, to connect to a current living tribe. But so one of the things that they asked us for, which we provided was what is called to provide some cultural affiliation with the remain. And the uh, NEPRA has several several areas that you can use. We, the one that we used was that there were, we were, our people were the only ones in the area over a thousand years ago, that none of the current BIA tribes that eventually came to Texas in the 1700s were too recent to have been uh, a descendant of any people maybe in a thousand years before. And the university accepted our documentation. So we went to NEPRA, uh, both the director of the center and I attended a uh, 
meeting of the NEPRA Advisory Council and presented our sides in Texas State as the, the Advisory Council for permission to give us the remains. So they sent that recommendation to the Secretary of the Interior. And in our slide there, you can see a letter that we got from the Secretary of the Interior approving the remains being returned to us. We were the 11th non-BIA tribe to have gotten remains to NAPRA at that time. So that's one of the uh, changes that NAPRA has done, and that's to allow non-BIA tribes to get remains. Uh, not all the Indians especially, or have federal recognition, but all the Indians do have ancestors that have been buried and are being dug up. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, like uh, Dr. Ariano mentioned, the city set aside two acres in one of their preservation parks for us to use as a repatriation cemetery. And we really don't like to use the word cemetery because the legal definition of cemetery under Texas uh, Health and Code, it means a place where it's a perpetual cemetery, but a repatriation burial site is different where only all remains can be repatriated. And, he, and uh, we found out the city made the uh, request that we set up a fence around the area so that it would be protected. And so when we inquire about the cost of the gate, they thought it was going to be $9,000, which we didn't have at that time and we don't have right now. So uh, we talked to the Texas State University Department of Anthropology, and they decided to pay for the fence. Uh, next slide, please. Here you see the people saying goodbye after our repatriating that remain in that, our first remain, and that was at our uh, repatriation site. And you can see on the bottom of the photograph, the area where we bury the individual and we place rounds, rocks around it, some flowers. Later on, people started putting a lot of flowers on the grave. Uh, next slide, please. So every one of the programs that we have is a it's a summer camp, we call it the summer encounter that we have for one week long. And we have with, with, with children and we teach them about their history and culture through the arts. And one of the things that we do, we take them to the site where the remain was removed and we take them to where the, our ancestor was removed and also where it was buried. And we tell them the, uh, the story of the ticket boot uh, ancestor. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. I've been talking about Texas State University, which is one of the universities I was going to compare with the other one. And the other university is the University of Texas at Austin. It has always been against the law to deserve a human grave. However, nationwide, there's over 7 million uh, ancestors that are being classified as culturally unidentifiable. And in Texas, there's over 3,500 remains that have been dug from the state of Texas. And of this 3,500, over 2,400 are housed at the Texas Research Laboratory at 
the University of Texas at Austin. And when we, uh, we always check all the inventories of everybody that's got remains, and we had always noticed that they had three remains that had been removed from Hayes County, which is here where San Marcos is. So we requested the three remains, we requested the three remains from the University of Texas. Next slide, please. Okay, here is a here is a picture of a warehouse where the remains are kept. Our ancestors are kept, and um, so UT denied our request. And one of the professors from Texas, from the University of Texas, decided to have his class here in in the building where the ancestors are kept. And he asked us to give, to do a presentation. And after the presentation, we asked the woman in charge of all the remains if we could go to where the remains were kept. And she took us outside the room where they're kept. So we asked her, and they had a they had a window, and they, they had a curtain. So we asked if we could look in. in, in inside the room and so she opened the curtain so we could see how the remains were kept in cardboard boxes on mental shelves and we'd see some students working in there with the remains. So we asked so we asked her if we could go inside and pray with our ancestors. And she said no. She denied our request to pray with our ancestors. And the thing is, I mean, who does it hurt or what problem is it going to cause to allow us to pray with our ancestors? I mean, we're supposed to have freedom of religion here in this country. And Native Americans have never actually really had freedom of religion. But this is very, this is one of the things that was very different from Texas State. Right away, Texas Texas State allow us to pray with, the, with the, the, our ancestor while they were being removed. Here, UT was not allowing us to pray. So we stayed out in the hall and we prayed in the hall. And there were, it, was a large, it was a class of about 25 students, including mostly graduate students and the professor. So... Next slide, please. We believe that it is extreme arrogance for an institution to own the remains of a people and deny their descendants spiritual right to rebury their ancestors. And that's one of the problems that all native people all around the country are having. When we started listening to your to this conference, we found out that most Native people were having the same problems that we are having here in Texas. And even though NAPRA is over, you know, will be 31 years old the 16th of November, you know, very few institutions have been obeying and following and following NAPRA. So one of the one of the uh, I wanted to do a very short summary contrasting the two the two institutions, Texas State and, and the University of Texas. I already mentioned the, one of them was the Texas State allow us to pray with our ancestor, while UT did not allow us to pray with our ancestors. And another difference was when we went through the process through Texas State. Only the, the director of the Center for Archaeological Studies was involved with NEPRA. And he was the one that was communicating with NEPRA. He was getting his approval from his boss, who was the chair of the anthropology department. <clears throat> when we were dealing with, with UT, University of Texas at Austin, after they denied, after they denied our request, they had the vice president of legal affairs 
contacted NEPRA. I mean, the vice president of legal affairs, that is the top lawyer for the university. He was the one who got in touch with NEPRA and he requested the remains for themselves, for UT to rebury the remains. And in his request, he mentioned that no Indian tribe had requested the remains, which we have been requesting for five years. And NEPRA was aware of this, or is aware of this. So it makes you wonder why is it that they have the top attorney in a top attorney doing the request. And we're running out of time, so I'm gonna really make it real fast now. Uh, I'll go ahead and go and, and just go over the last one. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the problems that we have is that there's no original Texas Indians with federal recognition. There's three reservations in here, but the three Indian reservations from Indians that are not original Texas Indians. So we need the uh, federal, non-federally recognized tribes to be supported in getting and reburying their ancestors. Next slide, please. So in Texas, where the ancestors are more than 1,000 years old, they're, they are classified as culturally unidentifiable. Institutions refuse to accept cultural, uh, a cultural relationship with original Texas Indians that have a 14,000 year old history of occupation of this land. So institutions need to accept legitimate documentation from original Texas Indians. Next slide, please. The institutions have all the power to make in determining of cultural affiliation and whether or not they will repatriate this. This puts the tribe as a major disadvantage. When it's the institution that determines whether they're gonna accept the cultural affiliation documentation provided, they are can make the decision if they don't want to give up the remains of saying, no, you know, this is not real or enough cultural documentation. Next slide, please. Also, another problem that we've been having with some institutions that I didn't go into this presentation, but they do not set a time period for their consultation process with the tribes. So as long as they do not provide a closing date for repatriation for consultation, you know, the process is open and they do not need to make, and they do not make a determination. So they can keep on, you know, the remains forever and ever because they never finish the consultation process. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is a picture of one of our powwows. You can see in the, you know, in the front, that's the, the southern drum, the host drum of our several drums that we have. And uh, you see the color guard behind the, behind the drum. So we are proposing that we start organizing an alliance of Texas Indian tribes or just tri other tribes, if we don't have any BIA tribes here, made out of BIA and non-BIA tribes so we can collectively request ancestors for alliance members. And then the the member where the, re re where the remains are from would be in charge of getting those remains and deciding where to rebury them and what type of ceremony they will provide to that. Uh, so we pray that communities worldwide will embrace the reburial of all ancestors. Next slide, please. So remember that our ancestors are waiting to be reburied. They're out there in agony and they need to be reburied. Thank you.
Our final topic is Committed to the Future, presented by Emily Aguilar. Ms. Aguilar will share the story of students and community members who gathered in defense of three ancestors held by the University of Texas at Austin. She led a mobilization that signaled a new era for those working for repatriation. Ms. Aguilar's voice is that of our future generations who will join in global strength to repatriate every single ancestor held by institutions. Ms. Aguilar is a Cuauhtecan arts educator and serves as a project coordinator for the Indigenous Culture Center Initiative. Ms. Aguilar earned her Master's of Fine Arts from the University of Texas at Austin in 2015. She holds a Certificate in Arts and Cultural Management and Entrepreneurship from the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. Ms. Aguilar has worked with the Institute on an ad hoc basis since 2013. She is the former director of the Mart Arts Management Program at Bowling Green State University, where she served on faculty. Ms. Aguilar leads the Institute's effort to establish an indigenous culture center in Hayes County, Texas. She currently resides and teaches in Austin. Ms. Aguilar. Amanam, everyone, thank you, Tia Maria, for that introduction and for your opening prayer. Thank you to Dr. Garza and Dr. Arellano for your teachings. I'm grateful and humbled to be presenting alongside you. In this section, I'll discuss the current and future commitments to repatriation efforts, the intersections with national and global movements, and strategies that other tribes and nations may use to support their own repatriation efforts. I will start by grounding us in the timeline and context of the events that transpired between June and September 2020 in our efforts to have three ancestors returned to us for proper burial. The ancestors, as Dr. Garza said, were being held at the J.J. Pickle Research Campus at the University of Texas at Austin. First, it's important to recall that this time period was at the height of the COVID-19 global pandemic. This placed significant constraints on our ability to organize in ways that we normally might and shifted our ability to meet and plan in person quickly. Subsequently, our organizing efforts took place online and through virtual meetings with social media and news media being our primary outlets for raising public awareness. Second, it's important to recall that these events transpired alongside and related to the national and global uprisings to affirm and support black relatives. During this time in Austin, there were numerous public marches, gatherings and uprisings related to officer involved murders of local citizens, as well as solidarity events to affirm the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. On a global level, we're also situated in a time when non-native and non-black people are gaining awareness of concepts such as land back, reparations, and reconciliation. It is within this context that these efforts gained momentum. It is within this context that these efforts will continue to thrive. On March 7, 2016, the Mia Congarza Band requested the remains of three ancestors from the University of Texas at Austin. Four years later, on June 3, 2020, Brian Roberts, the head of the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory, responded to the Mia Congarza Band denying the request. Between 2016 and 2020, much communication was exchanged and many obstacles were introduced by UT Austin in violation of NAGPRA. On July 13, 2020, Dr. Garza appealed to then interim president Jay Hartzell requesting the remains. On August 19, 2020, the Mia Congarza Band sent public appeals, media, and relatives asking for letters to be written to President Jay Hartzell. On June 23rd, I asked my elders for permission to organize a peaceful demonstration at the University of Texas campus. On August 30th, an initial planning meeting was commenced with organizers. By September 2nd, just a few days after that initial meeting, an initial prayer was held at UT Austin's flagship campus. By September 7th, just a few days later, 
a public ceremony was held at the JJ Pickle Research Campus where our ancestors are held and continue to be held to this day. This event ignited a wave of public support, which ultimately resulted in UT Austin reversing its denial. When the denial of repatriation was received, the Miyakan Garza Band sent a public plea to all relatives near and far. This included tribal members, students from the University of Texas at Austin, Indigenous Cultures Institute staff and volunteers, and academic colleagues. It was at this time that I formally asked our elders for permission to organize a sit-in at UT Austin. The goal would be to pressure UT to reverse their decision. When this idea received their blessing, we moved forward by getting everyone into a virtual be involved and begin organizing. This service members, relatives, and elders. It was important that this event be COVID safe, accessible for all people, and generated community support. We also knew that we wanted multiple modes of participation for all people, so an in-person event and a virtual way to support this action. We knew that we wanted to pray with the ancestors. It hurts our hearts that they're being kept in cardboard boxes, on shelves, alone in a dark room, their journey disturbed. What started as the idea for a sit-in involved into a private prayer at UT Austin on their main campus in front of their iconic clock tower. Normally, it's not our way to film prayer. However, we wanted to be able to show the non-native public the visual representation of UT Austin holding our ancestors in cardboard boxes. This is why we filmed this event to create documentation that would then be disseminated to ignite community support for repatriation, and it worked. Community support was ignited and channeled through simultaneous and targeted routes. We organized a letter writing campaign which provided the public with an email and letter template to send to interim president of UT, Jay Hartzell, as well as to the director of TARL, Brian Roberts. The public also had the option to call or express concern in person, which many graduate and undergraduate students did. We also began doing public interviews with Austin's NPR station and local newspapers. This press served two purposes, to educate the non-native public on the issue, as well as to generate community support and action. This fed into the in-person ceremony at the JJ Pickle Research Campus where our ancestors are held and continue to be held. At this ceremony, prayer songs, dances, speeches, and teachings were given. An altar was co-created by the public, inviting participants to offer sacred items to be left with the ancestors. This event was live streamed on Instagram and Facebook, as well as held in person. In total, several, several thousand people engaged with this event, both locally and throughout Turtle Island. And this event was also heavily covered in the press. All of these actions combined pressured the UT president and fellow administrators to meet with UT indigenous students and representatives in person. These indigenous students prepared in just a matter of days for this high stakes meeting. They had clear goals for this meeting and they each took one of these goals and represented their argument thoughtfully and efficiently through presentations rooted in data, storytelling, and personal experience. Put differently, these students came armed to represent the Mia Congarsas, Indigenous students at UT, and the local Indigenous communities. This meeting began with UT President Jay Hartzell and the Vice President for Legal Affairs, James E. Davis, explaining why the remains could not be re-interned to the Mia Congarsa band. Once students were permitted to speak, they each enveloped attendees in powerful data-driven stories. Stories about what it's like to be an indigenous student on UT's campus. Stories about how few resources indigenous students have at UT. Data such as the fact that indigenous students and faculty make up less than 1% of UT's campus in the largest state in the US and a state with one of the highest indigenous populations. Some of the quotes from this meeting are provided here, and I want to highlight the powerful strategies that these students employed. 
The first strategy was rooting their arguments in research and data pulled from the UT indigenous student population. Some quotes include, quote, native kids simply feel like they don't belong here. And this could be the story of UT and Indian country. And there's an educational benefit to saying yes to this. Another strategy I want to highlight was the fact that these students rooted their argument in their indigenous student perspective, saying things like, quote, live up to the land acknowledgement you just gave. These strategies were effective because these students walked the administrators through the point of view of indigenous people harmed by colonial institutions through an indigenous strategy that has survived through millennia and that's storytelling. These young people told their stories and the stories of their people. They made these administrators look them in the eyes as they did that. So that if they were to deny us these remains, they would always at least remember that we exist, that we are still here and that we speak. These administrators may forget about this meeting. They may forget the exact details of these stories, but they would never forget how this moment made them feel. These young people are their stakeholders. These students are their stakeholders. And at the end of the day, the universities are a business. Immediately following the meeting on the same day, the president issued a letter to the Mia Congarces reversing their denial and committing to promptly moving forward to reinter our ancestors' remains. So I just wanna quickly summarize our strategies here. And one thing I want to note is that with regard to public press on a national level, this was covered in Indian country today. So it did put UT in a national spotlight through not only Indian country today, but also through NPR. Today, UT has yet to return our ancestors to us. The latest update is that they're requesting permission to bury the ancestors themselves. This shows us that even when you have a promise from the president in writing, it isn't a guarantee. We know that these institutions prefer dead Indians to live ones. They prefer to study our remains than cultivate good relations with the living. They consider us artifacts, but they forget that we speak. In our language, we say, Nakun, we speak to you. It is through us speaking that we hope that other tribal entities may find these strategies useful. Already, the youth are leading these movements. Currently, the Indigenous Cultures Institute is working to establish the first Indigenous-led Indigenous Cultures Center in the state of Texas. This would preserve over 10 acres from looming development beside one of our most sacred sites, Ahewakiana, or the so-called San Marcos Springs. 95% of the land in Texas is privately owned. This means that NAGPRA only applies to 5% of the land in Texas, which is public land. This is why working with public universities which reside on public land is a key strategy we've identified in the state of Texas to have our ancestors returned to rest. This is a call to action for an international alliance for repatriation. We believe that all tribes and nations must collaborate to restore indigenous sovereignty and interrupt the power that is exerted by colonial institutions. We invite collaboration and are open to working with entities that are committed to restoring balance. I will now share a message from our Kauatek and ancestors. Minakwe maline aknatamo ham samohu. Napilam taman hamin sa nahau. Nakum hamin hoi hagusa nahau bah taptai. It is now time to return our spirits home to rest. Our people call on you to return our bodies. We speak to you to work together for our bodies to return to Mother Earth. Yomanam, thank you. At this point, we'd like to turn this over to questions and answers. And I think we'll have the assistance of uh, our host. Yeah, hi, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for enlightening all of us about your struggles uh, going on in Texas. If you wouldn't mind um, uh, bringing your um, share screen down and um, let's go to Q&A. So everyone knows the Q&A button up there. Um, please put your question there or raise your hand 
and uh, we're happy to call on you there as well. So um, you, you all spoke a little bit while we're waiting for a question, I'll ask one. We spoke a little bit about NAGPRA and whether NAGPRA applies to state recognized tribes. I know the, to me, the legal definition of Indian tribe under NAGPRA would include state recognized tribes, but there's many institutions and uh, who, who don't practice that. And I'm wondering what um, either uh, legal uh, discussions you've had with people, if you've talked with the National NAGPRA program about these issues, or, or how have you struggled with this issue of, of defining Indian tribe under NAGPRA? Any one of you who wants to answer. You want to take this one, Dr. Garza? Well, I, uh, we haven't, that's just, that's a topic that we have not discussed with, uh, with NAPRA. And uh, maybe we should ask you, since you're an attorney mm -hmm. and you're, you're with the Association of American Indian Affairs, I don't know if, yeah, because that's a, that's a, um, I mean, there's a lot of issues and problems we have been dealing with and that we have never got, gotten around to that. One of the, talking about this, you, every time I give a presentation and we talk about, mention that we don't have uh, federally recognized tribes in Texas, you know, somebody always says, well, why don't you get recognized? And the thing is that the, the, the process that they have to recognize more Indians as BIA, it was intentionally made not really to work. As you know, out of the over 300 that have applied for federal recognition, only 17 have been given federal recognition since the process started. One of the problems that we have, and, 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 and I discussed it with, uh, with Ruben, uh, since he's our historian, is that we have to document that we existed legally as a political unit since 1900. And because when we were part of, when Texas was a uh, republic, the second president, Mirabu Lamar, passed a policy of total extinction and total repulsion of American Indians. So most of our people went underground and and because we had already been uh, Christianized, baptized as Catholics, we it was for the, for the sake of survival, we decided to, to pass as Mexicans because we all had Spanish last names and we had learned Spanish. So we, so, you know, we were able to stay in our homeland. But one of the disadvantages of that was that we did not get federal recognition. But another reason is that by the time that the Texas joined the United States, none of the Indians had any land that uh, the United States was willing to sign a treaty and give us and recognize us so they could be able to take our land like they did with most of the other tribes. And we were never big enough to go to war against the United States. But uh, that's another story. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, that's a that's a, a very good, a very big issue, and we need to tackle that uh, soon. Because, uh, but, but we have, like I mentioned, we were the eleventh non-federally recognized tribe to get and remains to NAPRA. so we still, you know. Some other institutions, like Texas State University, was willing to give us remains through through NAPRA, and we have been getting remains from from people that own private property. Because according to archaeologists, archeologi they have documented that this area in San Marcos was continuously populated by our people for over 14,000 years. So in, in 14,000 years, you know that a lot of our people live here, but they also died here and were buried here. 
So there's a lot of uh, native burial sites here in this area. So we have been lucky enough that uh, some of the landowners where some of those remains are that have been uncovered have been willing to give them to us. And so we, a lot of our Texas non-federal recognized tribes have been doing some repatriations because of remains that have been given to, to them by the landowners. So, and, and like uh, Emily mentioned, only 5% of the land in Texas comes under uh, NAPRA because the, I mean, I mean, does not come under NEPRA because over 95% is privately owned. And you know, the, you know, here in Texas, private property, if you own property, you own everything above it, on it, and under it, including human remains and artifacts that are under your land. And they, that's a problem of the philosophy of the recognizing private ownership. But uh, maybe we can talk about that later. Thank you. And I'm sorry I couldn't I didn't have a, a better answer for you. That's okay. Uh, Dr. Ar Arlano, did you want to say anything on that? No. I'm sorry, say again. I'm sorry. Did you want to 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 respond in any way, or should I move on to the next question? Um, can you just please repeat uh, the premise of the question again? Uh, it was it was simply what your um, what your efforts have been under NAGPRA as a state recognized tribe, and uh, whether you've had any legal analysis of that question or reached out to the national. NAGPRA program to talk about it. Right. No, I think most of what uh, um, Tio Mario here just uh, mentioned uh, is the extent of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're still working that out. We're, we're still trying to figure out how we can um, approach NAGPRA in relation to our status as a people, as a state recognized tribe, and how we can extend maybe some, some more um, um, procedures that state institutions can follow that will enable us to adequately request remains and I have to go through all the loops and hurdles like uh, Emmy, uh, uh, Emily just uh, discussed with uh, UT Austin where you know they, they give us one response to appease us on the one hand and on the other hand they talk to their attorneys to their lawyers and they decide that well since they're not legally recognized as a, as a indigenous group, as a Native American tribe, then we don't have any obligation to return any remains or artifacts to them. So it's, it's I mean, it's, it's really, it, it has a lot to do with the way that Texas's own laws in terms of property are designed. And as uh, Tio Mario was saying, you know, it's, it's really about the proprietor who owns the land and the artifacts and the remains that, that are found there. Uh, when it's remains, they have to go through a separate process because they have to make sure that these aren't recent remains, for example. They have to make sure that it's not a missing person case or what have you. So that's a, a separate process. But once the remains are determined to be culturally unidentifiable, that's when institutions of higher learning or museums come in and they um, you know, sweep up um, whatever artifacts they, they can. And so we're still trying to negotiate this, this uh, the legal mechanisms that uh, are complicated because of Texas, the way it structures its legal um, uh, procedures that in comparison and in, 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 uh, with NACPRA, right? So that's, that's still a conversation that, that's ongoing. Thank you. And, and just to let you know, remember that federal law has precedence over state law mm -hmm. um, and would be happy to talk to you more about, about these issues. So let's get to some of these questions that we have in the Q&A. Um, let's see, we've got one here. It said, you said 95% of land in Texas is private. What's the relationship and or direction for accessing any sacred sites or ancestors on those lands? Mm -hmm. Well, so the, it, yeah. Go ahead. 
Okay, um, let me answer briefly, and then uh, Emily, I'll turn it over to Emily. Uh, it depends on the landowner. We, the, you know, there's no set process. And uh, and one one of the problems that we have in Texas is, um, I mean, there's a lot of liberal friendly landowners, but that's not universal. That's not that's not common. That's not the majority of them. The majority of them uh, don't want to, you know, confront the history of the state or of this nation with native people. So right now we don't we don't have a, any process set up. It, you know, whenever some landowner approaches us that they have remains and they want to return them, that's when we work with them. But we don't have any any set up process that automatically, you know, they're going to come and contact us or any of the other uh, local, non, you know, Indian tribes here in Texas and other parts of the state. Because, it's, you, know, te you know, Texas is pretty, pretty big. And uh, the attitude of people in the panhandle are very different than the attitude of, of those landowners in South Texas. Okay, maybe Emily, now you want to respond? Um, with regard to prayer, it used to be that we would have to pay a fee to Texas State to be able to pray and to do our medicine ceremonies on what used to be their lands. Um, and then they've developed a good relationship with us, and so we no longer have to pay to hold our ceremonies there and to hold our powwow there. Um, and with regard to other sacred sites, they, most of our sacred sites are on public land in the form of parks, like city parks and metro parks. And so they're publicly accessible. It also means that we don't have privacy um, in the same way. So when we go to our sacred springs, which is the site of our creation story and our most sacred site, there's always people around and will sometimes be taking pictures or kind of you know, curious and watching us as we're trying to, to pray. And so um, sometimes it's respectful and sometimes it's not. Like most recently when we had a prayer, we had um, a gentleman accost us and accuse us of occupying without a permit and um, you know, getting in our faces and was very hostile. So it just depends on the person and the day. Um, but you know, as far as um, access physically, it's pretty simple for us to access it now, but that's because of the work that Dr. Garza and Maria did to establish those relationships with Texas State and with other institutions and entities. That's great. I am going to invite um, Judith Shapiro, who's an attorney, um, onto the stage. Judith, if you'll raise your hand, uh, we'll invite you up here, because I would like us to explore a little bit about um, uh, NAGPRA and what we often find uh, with NAGPRA and then issues outside of NAGPRA is that they all get jumbled up and it's really easy to get thrown off the track if you don't clearly understand what NAGPRA provides and what it doesn't and what state law provides for and what it doesn't. And, and Judy has a, a lot of experience working with state recognized tribes and has also worked very recently on uh, the meanings in NAGPRA. Hi, Judy. Hey, I'm <laughs> not expecting that. Um, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for joining us. I thought maybe you could just spend a little time talking about uh, the Indian tribe definition in NAGPRA and what that means as far as those federal programs Sure, had, had, I, had I only prepared it and had it in front of me. But the, the language in the statute, and that's what governs, is um, it defines tribes as entities that are eligible for uh, special programs in the United States because of their status as Indians. And in the recent proposal to amend the regulations, the proposal in the regs was to add in as evidence by the list, you know, the list of federally recognized tribes. And when Shannon and I were working on that recently, we said, oh, no, 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 that's not in the statute. So the, the statute as written does not expressly require federal recognition. It's just not there. Um, and the fact of 
eligibility for special programs by virtue of their status as Indian tribes, there are several federal programs, just not through the Bureau, um, that are open for state recognized tribes. There's uh, preference in contracting in the Small Business Administration, there's LIHEAP, there's, um, and I don't have a list in front of me, but we, we actually did a filing on behalf of the Alliance of Colonial Era Tribes, which is primarily East Coast tribes um, that trace their roots back to the colonial era. And some are recognized, federally recognized, some are not. Um, but the fact is that there are states that do participate in federal programs and it's the eligibility that matters, not the participation. So whether you participate in those programs doesn't matter, but as state recognized tribes, you are eligible, and um, we believe that there's a very good argument that you are fully eligible under NAGPRA. Um, having said that, um, I want to touch briefly on the issue of state versus federal recognition and the federal recognition process. And I say this having been working in this process for almost 30 years, which is almost long enough to do a petition. Um, it is a terrible process. Um, and I agree with you, it is a terrible process um, and certainly a resource heavy process. But some of what I'm hearing in your discussion of the history suggests that you have a lot, uh, that a lot of what you've done in order to um, access rights of repatriation as an unofficial way may get you far along in the federal acknowledgement process. The fact that people went underground, that happened a lot. And if you get to the East Coast tribes, their treaties all predate the United States, so they can't point to federal treaties. Um, the fact that the regs were recently revised, I guess recently 2015, that's you know that's recently in, in federal recognition time, um, to provide that you only have to show that a historical existence from uh, before 2000, before 1900, which means that if there are records in 1990 identifying a tribal entity, that is a leg up. Um, 10 years ago, I would have told you that's gonna be even much harder, but if, if you have a showing of cultural and, and cultural continuity through, you know, starting in 1990 and then going forward, um, some of the showings of con continuing political uh, existence do not require a formal recognition by anyone outside and doesn't necessarily require a formal government structure that anybody saw. Uh, but it, but the fact that people were holding together despite all the pressures from outside to, to fragment may be enough to structure that continuing um, political existence. So it, it's worth thinking about those things. Not, not that I say it's easy. And not that I would tell you the you know absolute likelihood of success kind of thing, but it's worth thinking about at least informally whether it might ease some of the situation to be able to say yeah we are because the Fed say we are. Um, and I again I'd, I'd be glad to have this chat. Thank you so much, Judy. And I want to invite our speakers and Judy and others if they'd like to continue this discussion about. Um, whether it's NAGPRA, whether it's the repatriation, repatriation provisions or the graves protection provisions of NAGPRA, let's, let's meet in the lounge area and talk a little more informally about this. I really want to thank our, our panelists today. You all were wonderful and gave such great passion um, and feeling to the issues that you're facing in Texas. Um, uh, we were glad that you were here and able to share this. Dr. Mario Garza, um, Emily Aguilar, uh, Dr. Ruben Arellano, and Maria Rocha, I really appreciate your time and your energy. And um, thank you, everyone. Everything back. <laughs>